get out of my way. One, two, three, four. Alright. Oh fuck. What the fuck? Oh my god. How's it going everyone? Uh it's been a while since I've done a, a game pass review. I know, I know, it's been a while. It's it's longer than you've been alive, Logan. Um yeah, this is the first time I've had Game Pass in like two years. And I've had it for two months now. Um and I've played a few games that recently came out throughout this year. Uh, that I want to give my thoughts on. Uh, either a review or a mini review or whatever. I'm having a brain fart right now. I just got up. <laughs> so, what have I been playing? Well, aside from a couple games that I missed out on last year because I didn't have an Xbox Series S at the time. You know, what I, I played uh, Forza Motorsport. The new one, which came out last year, and that was pretty good, but still not as great as the ones on 360. Um, I also, on and off, had been playing Starfield, and uh, I'm just going to say I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it at all. I don't want to say it's a terrible game. It's not as bad as, say, like Fallout 76, but I don't think it's a good game either. It's very tedious. It's very... Boring, repetitive, uh, buggy. I will have a, a, a shit montage at some point early on next year for you guys. So usually when I do one of these, I review four games. But this time around, I'm only reviewing three. The reason being is because on top of those two other games I've been spending time playing, uh, two of these games I spent a lot of time on. So... I didn't really have time to play any, like, new indie games that came on it. Let's start off in chronological order of release. The first game I'm going to talk about is Hellblade 2. Now, I, I was a huge fan of the first Hellblade game that came out back in 2017. I gave it, I gave it a 9.5 out of 10. I even named it my 2017 game of the year. I loved Hellblade 1. And the reason why I loved it, it wasn't just because of how amazing it looked or how amazing it sounded or even how powerful Melina Jurgen's performance was. It was the message within Hellblade 1. It was a very personal journey, both for the player and for her. Uh, there was only one character in that whole game, and it was her. And... Uh, Everything that you heard was in her head. So it was a lot more deep in terms of mental illness and, and psychosis. Uh, it was about grief and uh, letting go of your loved one. And it was a far more personal journey. Now, Hellblade 2... Her her mental illness was, was still there, but it was kind of like on the back burner. It wasn't like the main focus. She found allies, real people, to fight real things. And they, they changed the narrative a bit that way. And that's not the direction I was hoping for. I was hoping to have more in the subconscious mind rather than in the real world, you know? Because that, that's one thing that made Hellblade 1 really unique was its themes. And it just wasn't really there in Hellblade 2. Now, do I still think Hellblade 2 was a great game? Yes. They still did a wonderful, do wonderful job with the audio and visual. It's still an audio-visual masterpiece. Melina Jurgen still killed it in her performance. And the writing itself was great, but the concept of her having real friends in a real setting and real this, real that, 
made it less up to interpretation or I I don't know. It, it just it felt less imaginative than the original, in my opinion. Um so it kinda it, it loses a full point because of that. It goes down to an eight point five. There are there were a couple bugs here and there. Nothing serious, but yeah, it goes down to an eight point five. But then it kinda loses another point. Because of the price. Now, may, maybe it's only a half a point. Because these are both games that are on Game Pass. So you can kind of excuse the price comparisons. Or if you buy the bundle, you get both games for a reasonable price. Hellblade 1 was an 8 hour long game that was 30 bucks. Hellblade 2 is a 6 hour long game for 50 bucks. So you're getting less for more. Did I say that right? I I, I don't know. I, I I have dyslexia, but but which like I said, when you have Game Pass, it it doesn't really matter because they're both on Game Pass. So, <clears throat> but if you want to own these games, it just sucks how. One of them is a shorter experience for more money. Maybe that's because it costs more to develop the sequel. Fine, but it doesn't change the case for us, the the, the consumers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give Hellblade 2 an 8 out of 10, but it's barely an 8. I was thinking about giving it a 7, but it, it still had the production quality that made one notable now, the second game I want to talk about is a game that I didn't finish. And there's a big reason for that. But it's also a game that I overall really have enjoyed so far. And that is Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl. Came out last month. I first tried to play the original Stalker back in April. And I tried it for a couple hours and I couldn't really get into it at first. Just because I wasn't really understanding the survival mechanics and all that. On top of the game itself feeling kind of out uh, outdated. Uh, in terms of uh, just general gameplay and movement and, and controls. Um, so I kind of put off on it. And then, you know, after a while I kind of forgot I even had it. Stalker 2 came out November 20th. I immediately wanted to try it. Just because I feel like... If I had played a new Stalker game that had less outdated gameplay with those mechanics still brought in, it would kind of help me go back to the old ones and be like, yeah, I, I get I get it now. I get how I play this. And Stalker 2 did just that for me. It made me a Stalker fan. I love the atmosphere of Stalker so much. Especially in Stalker 2. Probably even more than Fallout, even more than Metro. is The atmosphere is incredible. I love the way everything looks. The, the, the Chernobyl exclusion zone. I love all the sounds that, con that you know, that, that, that the anomalies and the Geiger counters and... The creepy ambiance and it, it just it all flows together really well to create a really post apocalyptic feel that, that you're really in there. And uh it's got creepy ass mutants, it's got bandits who don't give a shit about anyone they shoot on sight. I love how when you're indoors you can hear rain hitting the roof over your head. It's like the rain over a tin roof and it's there are moments where it's kind of like relaxing. You you know you're safe in a secluded settlement and you hear the rain coming down on you. The atmosphere in Stalker 2 is perfect. I love the presentation of the world in this game. It is my favorite atmosphere of 2024 in any, in any game. It's a first person shooter. Uh, it, it is open world. It seems like they combine all the 
areas, or maybe not all, but most of the areas from the other, the, the original trilogy into Stalker 2, and it is massive. I only played like half of it, and I spent at least 40 hours, maybe even 50 hours. So there's like 100 hours of content here, guys. And I grew to love the mechanics. Like when your your weapons and armor, they slowly wear down and you either have to repair them or scavenge different weapons from, from dead bodies. And your weapons can jam when their durability decreases. Your weapons jam and you gotta unjam it, reload it and stuff in order to continue. And a lot of times this happens during firefights. Actually, it, it only happens during firefights and it can create... A really intense moment. You gotta take cover and and unjam it. And uh, I love how radiation causes radiation sickness, like acute radiation sickness, where your health gradually goes down if you breathe in too much radiation. I think that is brilliant. That is something that Fallout Five needs to do because if if Fallout 5 is just the same radiation shit as before, it's not going to cut it for me. Because to me, this is like the new, the new best way to handle radiation. Radiation sickness in a game. I loved playing this game. Now, when this game first came out, it was really, really buggy. And I didn't mind it at first, though. I'm like, okay, yeah, uh... This this dwarf mutant grabbed my gun out of my hands using using telepathic abilities, which is intentional, by the way. And then right after that, another one of his kind walked up from behind me and catapulted me into outer space. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know what? I'm okay with that because that bog, even though I had to reload my save, was at least funny. It's a funny bug, and I recorded it. And by the way, like Starfield, I will have a Stalker 2 bug montage later next year. Okay? So you got two bug bug montages coming your way. But this one's going to be funnier than Starfield. Um, so I continued to play it a little bit more. And uh, the story was really starting to get really interesting. I'm not going to spoil it. It was getting really interesting. And I encountered game-breaking bugs, unfortunately. Game-breaking bugs that would prevent you from doing quest lines. Most of them side missions, some of them main missions. And that was when I pulled the plug and, be, and, and was like, I'm not going to play this anymore. Until they patch these things mostly the mission bugs i don't really mind the environment bugs as much but the main mission bugs need to be fixed now i heard that in the last patch they did fix some of those mission bugs i haven't gotten back to it yet but it, it was very buggy overall and there are missing features you see when I took a break from Stalker 2 and was like, yeah, I'm going to wait until they patch this some more, I went back to Stalker 1, loaded my two-hour-long save, and I immediately fell in love with Stalker 1 because of what I learned from Stalker 2. The locations, the mechanics, and all that, and I actually, I actually prefer Stalker 1 over Stalker 2 now. And maybe that's because... It's nowhere near as buggy. But also, because it made me realize that Stalker 2 actually has missing features. Stalker 2 doesn't have A-Life. Now, for those of you who don't know what the A-Life system is, A-Life is basically uh, the AI coding for, for enemy patrols. When they patrol the zone, they actually... They actually have like a schedule, like a pattern to make the game feel more real and lively and organic. 
uh, Stalker 2 enemies, they just spawn next to you. Like, you would you would be running in a fear, field, right? And they would immediately just, like, spawn right behind you where you just were. As if it's, like, some RPG or something. And that's not what Stalker is supposed to be. They're also missing binoculars, where you could kind of, like, scope out places for enemies. Uh, Stalker 2 is also missing night vision scopes. So, it's just like, I'm loving Stalker 1 more, just because it's a more complete package. Stalker 1 was almost turning into one of my all-time favorite games, except when I got to the Chernobyl power plant near the end, and the difficulty spiked immensely. <clears throat> now, obviously, it's the home base for uh, for the main antagonist, the, the monolith group. Which is understandable. Maybe it should be harder than the rest of the game. But having to fight hordes and hordes and hordes, dozens and dozens, maybe even over a hundred heavily armored guards in a really enclosed space where being right around the corner gets you killed instantly. This pissed me off. The underground section of the power plant pissed me the fuck off. It also made you constantly use antibiotics for radiation because not only were you getting shot at from everywhere, but there was radiation everywhere too. It was a very bad experience. I hate the last level of Stalker 1. But other than that, I love the rest of the game of Stalker 1. You know? And then I went on to Clear Sky, which was a prequel to Stalker 1, and I don't like it. I was only able to play that for like five hours, and I just got turned off by it. Uh, there are a couple new interesting things about about Clear Sky. It introduced factions. You can have faction wars. You can pick pick your faction side, I guess. I don't know. It, it seemed a little one-sided to me, though. Like, there, there were obvious good guys versus bad guys. They kind of made it pointless to be able to choose. It did introduce the guides, which are NPCs that allow you to fast travel at a price, uh, which is cool, I guess. But honestly, this was something I didn't use in Stalker 2. I just loved being on foot all the time and exploring everything as I go. So I didn't really bother with the guides and, and clear sky that much either. But I just couldn't get into it. The The combat felt really floaty. The The gunplay felt like shit. Like, they, they, like, you couldn't aim down iron sights with your pistol for some reason. And when you aim down the sights with other guns, shooting it causes your, your aiming to sway constantly. And it's, it's just a really really fuzzy experience and uh it's buggier too than uh than stalker one i encountered floating enemies and stuff floating you know floating bandits who couldn't move but they were just shooting you and it just yeah clear sky i do not like that's my least favorite i hear the the third one call appropriate is the all-around best stalker game i haven't gone to that one yet maybe if I'm going to try to give Clear Sky another chance, and if it still doesn't work for me, I'm just going to pass and go to Call of Pripyat. But back to Hard of Chernobyl. For my, for my final score, I am going to give, as it stands right now, because I bet it's still really buggy. I bet there are still missing features. I'm going to go ahead and give Stalker 2 a 7 out of 10. And that's with the fixed missions in mind. This was actually a 6 when I stopped, okay? Because I take these things very fucking seriously when there are bugged missions. I'm going to bump it up to a 7. I'm going to be nice just because I've heard people say that they, they, they fixed some of those issues at least. So, Stalker 2, as of right now, gets a 7. But this has the potential to go all the way up to a fucking 10, okay? The, the potential is there. They can fix all the bugs. Add in a life, add in those missing mechanics by binoculars, uh, night vision. This could easily be a nine out of ten. 
but it's not there yet. As much as I loved playing this, this should not have come out in December. It should have come out a few months later, like February or March 2025, uh, because it, it was not cooked yet. They had the right ingredients, it just wasn't cooked yet. So, yeah, um, that's Talker 2. Sorry I went on a, little, on a little escapade across the whole series. I just wanted to give you guys my full experience now that I'm like a full Stalker fan. <laughs> and last but not least, and I really mean not least because I did save the best theme for last, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. I am singing his theme song Cause of YouTube Copyright bullshit Public domain And free use Doesn't exist when YouTube strikes you down as copyright Nazis Sorry, I, I I just had to do that little tidbit again for my, my recording in Alone in the Dark because this was actually more appropriate to use because it's an actual Indiana Jones game. This game is awesome, guys. <laughs> I was not expecting it to be this good. And that's because I was one of the ones who were skeptical about a first-person Indiana Jones game. Now, I still would have preferred it to be third-person, and I'll get to I'll get to why later. But this really feels like I'm playing as Indiana Jones. First off, Troy Baker, the voice for him, gets his accent down his very monotone kind of sarcastic he gets that harrison ford accent down perfectly it is uncanny it is haunting troy baker has always done a tremendous job but this right here has to be my all-time favorite performance by him he delivered what is in my opinion the most impressive performance of any voice actor has given this year. Troy Baker did an excellent job. Like, I I am still quite blown away by how great he impersonated Indiana Jones and by extension Harrison Ford. They might actually use him to voice Han Solo in a Star Wars game because they sound... I, you know, they, they sound identical. Harrison Ford isn't exactly known for vocal range. So if he can do, if he can do indie, he can do any performance from Harrison Ford. So if they decide to make like a, the fugitive game, he can be like, I didn't kill my wife. <laughs> or Air Force One, get off my plane. <laughs> Trey Baker is your man to do it. Now that I got that out of the way, the voice acting is a 10. The gameplay and combat, man, I love his whip. I love how you can swing, you know, across across chasms. You can also use your whip in combat to disarm enemies and pull them towards you so you can just punch them right in the jaw. I love the fist fighting combat, okay, and how you can counter people and just... Ugh, take that, you fucking Nazi. And he, he says really funny shit, too, when you, when you knock out enemies. He's like, watch and learn, fellas. Or like, this fella hit like a wet noodle. <laughs> I love the commentary. I love just the gameplay and, and the immersion of being Indiana Jones, sneaking around, uh, using random items and objects as in improvisational weapons. Like guitars to smash over people's heads. Uh, you can use fucking brooms. You can even use like a fly swatter. Even though it shouldn't do anything. It does. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, it's not realistic. But it's fucking Indiana Jones. Who cares about realism in Indiana Jones? You know, finding fucking Noah's Ark. For God's sake. Um, <clears throat> whoops. I spoiled the uh, the ending for you guys. I love how Indiana Jones and the Great Circle prioritizes stealth and improvisation over guns blazing. Because that's not what Indiana does. And yes, you can take you can pick up other enemies' rifles and like submachine guns and shoot. 
but you can't reload, you can't collect ammo except for like revolver ammo, because Indy does have a revolver. Not that I ever really felt like I needed to use it though, but you can basically, when you're finished shooting or when the, the magazine is empty, you can turn the rifle around and use it as a melee weapon until it breaks and just bash people's heads open with it. And such a great experience. I've I've never quite played anything like it in terms of first person games. And maybe I didn't give this game a chance at first because it was first person. Then I saw the reviews and I saw how it got like an 8.7 out of 10 from almost everyone. And saw who it was made by. Machine Games. The same guys who made the, the modern Wolfenstein games. And aside from Youngblood, which sucked, they did a tremendous job with, you know, the, the New Order and the Old Blood and the New Colossus. So I'm like, okay, cool, I'll try it. And I'm so glad I did. Because it really feels like you're in Indiana Jones shoes. Solving really hard puzzles. Escaping tremendous just cataclysms and temples falling on you and shit. At the beginning of the game, you even experience that iconic opening in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Where he collects the golden idol for the guy and then the guy betrays him. And then the guy ends up dead in a trap with spikes coming out of his head and chest. And you get to experience that as the opening of Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. Uh, the, the side characters are great too. Uh, Hera Voss, the main villain, is so diabolical. So easily hated. He's like this fucking twisted, psychotic Nazi uh, archaeologist. He kind of reminds me of the creepy guy from the, the first Indiana Jones movie. The, the guy with the trench coat and glasses. The creepy, creepy guy that's like, you know, I forgot his name. But he's, you know, you know who I'm talking about if, if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's like the second mean bad guy in that. There are other characters too. Gina, which is like the love interest. And you know, you know how Indiana Jones always has a woman by his side. She's great too. Uh, there's this giant who is at first like a villain, but then you both find out that you have a common enemy who is Voss, and you start working together and shit. And um, and I don't know who voices Marcus Brody or is it Brody or Brady? Marcus Brody. Uh, Denholm Elliott played him in the original trilogy. Uh, whoever the voice act actor was for him now also did a a side by side perfect job too. The the Eng the new English guy who voices Brody sound sounds exactly like him. I don't know who you are, but you deserve praise too, okay? Even though you're not in it anywhere near as much as Troy Baker, you deserve praise as well. Uh oh, the the giant is actually uh voiced by Tony Todd who passed away last month, I think. God bless you, man. Uh, rest in peace, because you did a tremendous job as well, Tony Todd. I'm going to miss you, man. There are things wrong with it. There are things I absolutely hate about Indiana Jones. I do hate the first person when you're in situations that call for set-piece moments or chase sequences. Because it doesn't show you a guided way through it. I, I died so many times, either falling to my death or not knowing where to go in time. And that's because it was in first person and I had to I had to look for these things myself when they weren't very obvious. Let me give you an example of chase sequences done right. The Uncharted series. They're third person games where the camera kind of rotates out of your control, but it does so to let you know where you have to go during intense chase sequences and stuff. there uh, It has what I call uh, guided chase sequences. Because Indiana Jones is first person, there is no guide. So I, I died so many times and I it even got to a point where I got frustrated. Just because like I, I couldn't really tell where exactly the game wanted me to go during these these temple runs and stuff it got more frustrating than it should have been it got more frustrating than than it needed to be so that's why i still think that even though the fist fighting is benefited in first person i will admit that 
I still feel that Indiana Jones and the Great Circle should have been third person for the most part because of these chase sequences. Also, another major gripe I have is the enemy AI. The enemy AI is dumb as fuck. Dumber than a bag of bricks. Like, it takes them a while for you to spot them. When, when, I, when I say a while, I mean wait until their question mark circle fills up gradually as you're, like, right in front of them, sneaking past them. I forgot to mention, there are also disguises that you can wear. You can disguise yourself as, like, a Nazi or, like, a priest, and that makes it so that they don't suspect you, because if you're running around in your, your iconic indie leather jacket and hat, they're instantly going to recognize you. They know who you are. So you got to use disguises. There is a catch when, when you, uh, when you wear a disguise, it doesn't really fool high-ranking officers, so when they see your face, they start to catch on to you, and you got to lose their line of sight. But the problem I have with the AI is that they just don't look for you long enough. Like, even when you're in the middle of a fight, and you, you know, you're, you're low on health and bandages and stuff, and um, you got to, like, run and hide, they just, they don't look for you long enough. You know, it takes like one minute and, and then they're like, oh, OK, well, he's gone. Like and then they go back to being dumber than a bag of bricks. It's just like there's not really any challenge in terms of the enemy AI. It's just like almost non-existent, man. Now, I maybe, maybe it's like this by design. Maybe maybe they, they intentionally made the Nazis fucking idiots. But still, I mean, it, it it's just. Come on, I need more of a challenge in terms of stealth. That's why a lot of the times, I, I later on, I didn't really bother with the stealth. I just went in like, who wants to fucking fight? I'll punch you all out. But then they have guns, and I'm like, shit, I gotta take cover and find myself a gun. What else is wrong with it? The enemy AI, the, the camera angles during chase sequences. Um, some of the puzzles later on, I found... Either frustrating or just exhausting because there was this one quest line, I think it was called like the Blessed Pearl, where it was just like hard puzzle after hard puzzle after hard puzzle with no breaks in between. I'm like, oh my god. Look, I get this is Indiana Jones, but fuck, there are too many goddamn puzzles here. <sighs> and I'm not a big puzzle guy personally. I knew what I was getting into though, Indiana Jones. There's got to be puzzles, but. There was a little too many puzzles near the end there. But other than that, oh, there are some bugs too. And I, the movement itself, the first person movement, when you're jumping, it feels kind of clumsy and floaty. The movement, uh, yeah, it needs some tweaking. It needs to feel more grounded, you know, because there are times when I jump as Indy and it feels like I'm on the moon, you know. The way he just jumps and then lands, it... it it's like there's not enough oxygen. It's just like, it's like, nah. Yeah, the controls are kind of mm, clumsy. There are times when I just like, I, I slid off a ledge trying to jump down to that ledge and I just fell to my death. Like, like, Fuck, God damn it, Indy. But other than that, man, other than those three issues, I love this game. I love the exploration. It's not really an open world game, but it is an open environment game. To clarify what I mean by that, I'm going to give you an example of an open world versus open environment. Open world is like Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West, where there's this like giant fields with random stuff thrown in there or like any ubisoft game where it's like a giant field like assassin's creed but random stuff thrown in there uh even elden ring is open world for the most part you know but it's a giant fields with dungeons just thrown in there random mini bosses thrown in there these days i prefer open environment games like the new tomb raiders where it there is free roam after story. You, you can collect everything after you finish Indiana Jones. But it's more intricately designed. Like, you have to really 
travel around, you know, riverbeds and, you know, stuff like that to get to where you need to go. There are adventure books, which are skill books. You can use you can use your points to buy them from a vendor, or you can just find them laying around hidden spots uh, in your adventures. And these basically are used to increase your stats, increase your health, increase your strength, your stamina, your recovery. Uh, you can unlock different abilities with these uh, skill books, and that really that really elevates it to feel like you're you're gaining something from exploring these things. It has a lot of rewarding exploration. I love the exploration in Indiana Jones. It is perfect. Out of the three games I'm reviewing today, this is the best one. And this is the only one that's going to end up in my top 10 best games of 2024. Indiana Jones in the Great Circle gets an 8 out of 10. I think I was going to give it a 9, but then the puzzles near the end, I'm like, shit, man, this is fucking obnoxious. It's it's almost a 9. It's an 8.5. But I don't do decimal points anymore. So it's an 8. Maybe I should go back to using decimal points. Because I have been playing a few games lately that are 8.5s or 7.5s. So maybe next year, even if, even if I don't review anything, I'll probably reinstate the decimal point system. So yeah, guys. I'm really sorry that this video took over half an hour of your time. I uh, wasn't expecting it to be this long, but um, yeah, those are the games I played. The three games that I, the three new games that came out this year that I played on Game Pass. I really gotta learn, I gotta learn how to speak. Thank you for watching. The Gamer Gods!